this you guys first of all we need to blow the conception that baptism in the holy spirit is an optional baptism baptism in the holy spirit is something that has to happen in order for us to enter the kingdom of heaven and court according to jesus it, and each baptism that we go through is a death and a birth okay it's the sowing of a seed and it being raised in a harvest. It's us giving up our life and being resurrected again okay it's an extreme cleansing by death that's what baptism means, okay? The purpose of baptism is not so that we can go down to an altar and have a supernatural experience with God and say that now we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, I know, you guys, that there is a doctrine in Pentecostal circles that says that everybody who is baptized in the Holy Spirit will have the outward evidence of speaking in tongues, now, I do not have the time to go into this and argue this with you, so we're just going to go straight to Scripture to blow this out of the water, okay? Here's the deal, you guys. The Bible says, do not go beyond what is written. And if you want to argue with me, I'm just going to look you right in the face and say the same Scripture over and over again. And either you're going to bow to it or you're not. It says, do not go beyond what is written. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise us that every person, every Christian, is who, when they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, will speak in tongues. It doesn't say that. Now I'm going to tell you what baptism in the Holy Spirit is according to the Word of God. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is the second baptism that Jesus talked about. He said it's the baptism that, that is by the Spirit. Okay, that John talked about is baptism by the Holy Spirit and by fire. It's one that only Jesus can do. Jesus was baptized in water. Okay, when John said, "Why are, why are you doing this? I, I don't really get this. You know, you don't need to be cleansed. I need to be cleansed by you." And Jesus said that it, that it was important that he did it. Okay, and the reason for that, you guys, is that he was fulfilling everything and he was being um, an example for us. Okay, he went through both of these baptisms himself as an example to us because he wants us to follow him. Okay, it's like that prophecy that says, "And a little child will lead them." See, he came. He came to lead us through that um, that map to salvation. Okay, and he led by example. Okay, and so. <clears throat> He went through that first baptism, and then he identified, and you're like, okay, when was Jesus baptized in the Holy Spirit? Oh, hmm, that's interesting. I never see, you know, the Holy Spirit coming down on Jesus and him speaking in tongues. Oh, I guess he didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit then. No, you guys. <laughs> the Bible tells us when he was baptized again, the second baptism. Jesus identifies in uh, Mark 10, 38b through 39, what this second baptism is. In his life, where it happened, okay? He's talking to his disciples. And he says to them, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Actually, this was James and John. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Okay? Now, what is that baptism? Well, let's read about it. Romans 6, 3 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Okay? So he identifies, the Bible identifies that this baptism that Jesus was talking about was the death he was getting ready to undergo. The cup that he was talking about drinking was that cup that had his blood, which was the blood of the new covenant. Okay? The blood that he was going to shed on the cross. It's talking about his death. Isn't that interesting? The second baptism that Jesus went through, that he uh, defined, that he identified as um, baptism in the Holy Spirit, okay? That we had to be born of the Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That second baptism, when it happened in Jesus' life, it was at the point where he died on the cross, where he submitted his will, specifically he submitted his will to the will of the Holy Spirit. That's baptism in the Holy Spirit. And when he submitted to the point of shedding his own blood. And that is baptism in fire. Okay? Now, lest you um, wonder if this is correct, I'm going to read you one more place. First John 5, 6 in the Amplified Version says this. This is he, talking about Jesus. This is he who came by or with water and blood, his baptism and his death. 
Jesus Christ, the Messiah, not by or in the water only, but by the water and the blood. And it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness because the Holy Spirit is the truth. So he identifies that, you know, he came by water and by blood. Okay. Jesus said, you have to be born of water and born of the spirit. John said, you have to be baptized in water. You have to be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire. There are only two baptisms, you guys. And he is equating that second baptism with blood, with the shedding of our blood. Now, Jesus said, he said, we are going to follow him into this baptism. And the reason that he had to make this clear in so many different places is because he knew that people were going to try to find a play, find a way to make up doctrines that said, we don't, we're not going to have to go through this. Okay. Cause this is the part where it gets hard. Okay. This is the part where we actually have to submit our will to God. All right. Now, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he submitted his will to the Holy Spirit, it was at a point where he was going to have to go and do something that was going to rip his life apart. OK, it was going to rip up his body. It was going to rip up his entire life. It was going to totally destroy any hope or dream that he had for his life on the earth. All right. He did not want to go through it. He made that very clear. He asked God to let it pass from him, but he said, not my will, but yours be done. It was at this point that the Holy Spirit's will was going to be consummated in Jesus' life. And it was at a point that was very serious because it meant that Jesus had to actually give up his life. All right? And see, so you guys, when we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that means we're saying, go ahead and come into my body and use me as your instrument. Let your spirit come into me. And, you know, possess me. Do your will. Don't do what I want to do. Do what you want to do. Okay? That's when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you guys. And, you know, when this initial encounter happens with God, a lot of times people do speak in tongues. And they do have supernatural experiences and wonderful experiences. But that's not the point. Okay? Don't get your eyes on the signs, guys. You've got to remember what the purpose of the baptism is. And when it comes to you, it may look like a night in a garden when you're sweating blood because you know you're getting, getting ready to have to do a sacrifice that you never wanted to do. But you know God's requiring it of you. And you're going to have to say, yeah, go ahead and do it. You're going to submit your will to him. And see, God says that if, you, if we obey his commandments, then the spirit of truth is going to come in. That his spirit, actually Jesus said that he and his father would come and make his home inside of us. That's when it happens, you guys, when we submit our will to him and we say we're going to obey you at the point when it's going to be really, really hard on our flesh. Now, up until this point, we've been in the desert, and, we, and you know, God has been wooing us, and we've been baptized in water just like the Israelites, and we've gone through some discomfort for our flesh. We've resisted our, our sinful nature. But like it says in Hebrews 4, 4, in your struggle against sin, remember, we're going to be struggling with sin. That's the point. That's what God's looking for. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, of shedding blood, Okay. This is the circumcision that can only be done by Yeshua, remember? It's a circumcision of the heart, not just the outward flesh. That means he's going to take his word and his will, and he's going to cut you to the heart, as it says that the word is a double-edged sword, and it cuts down right into to your heart and judges the thoughts and intentions of your heart, okay? That's what that's going to do. And you guys, that's when you know that you are truly submitted to God. Because, you know, out here in the desert, we, we experienced some discomfort. We were thirsty. We were hungry. We had to learn to trust in God for our provision. But this is a new level here, okay? This is a level where we're actually laying down our lives, all right? And that's when the consummation really happens, when we are, are willing to let God bring us to the point where he's going to cut us and we're going to bleed. It's like Job said, though he slay me, I will still trust in him. That is this point in the garden, you guys. And, you know, God knows that, that we, we, want, we want to believe that we're not going to have to follow him in his death. And people make up doctrines that say, well, Jesus said it is finished, you know. So he did all the hard stuff, and now I just get to live in, in riches and prosperity and never have to be sick and never have to go through anything hard. La, la, la. Jesus knew people would say stuff like that. And you guys, please understand, Satan would love for you to believe that. You know why? Because... If you're not willing to suffer, then when God comes to you with that second baptism, you won't have any of it. You'll say, oh, that's not God, that's Satan. You'll be like Peter when Jesus said, I'm going to have to die on a cross. And Peter said, no, that's never going to happen to you. What did Jesus say? He said, get behind me, Satan. And that's what you've got to say. When it comes time for you to suffer, and you've got a preacher over here saying, oh, well, if you've really got it, if you've really got the Holy Spirit, and you really know God's will and God's word, then you're going to know that that's just Satan coming to try to take what's really rightfully yours. You know what you say to that spirit? Get behind me, Satan. Because Jesus Christ said, if you want to be my disciple, 
then you have to take up your cross and follow me. He said, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Jesus knew that people would say that, so he made it real clear. No, you're going to have to take up your own cross, okay? You're going to have to go through this baptism with me, okay? <laughs> so that's what we do. That is baptism in the Holy Spirit, you guys. All right? Don't be deceived. Don't let that be robbed from you. Like it says in 1 John 5, 6, again, when it's talking about Jesus, it says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. Again, you have to be baptized in both, you guys. You have to go through both baptisms, okay? And this is the witness. This is the evidence that God is looking for, all right? We don't need to be testing God by looking for special effects and seeing if God's really going to do what he promised to do. No, he said that he promised if you ask him for his Holy Spirit, that he would give it to you, period. Okay? So have confidence in that, that God is coming with this baptism. And he says that he ha baptizes you with Holy Spirit and, and with fire. Now, what does the Bible say that the fire is? In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, it says this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Remember this phrase, all kinds of trials. All kinds, okay? These have come so that Satan can rob from you what is really yours? No, that's not what it says. These kind, all these trials, all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Okay? And the Bible talks about the fire as a refining fire, and it talks about God as a refiner who refines gold in the fire many times. Okay? That's the purpose of fire, you guys. And what is fire? when you have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, okay? Suffering, that's what it is. That's what the fire is. In uh, Proverbs 17, 3, it says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tries the hearts. You see, he's our refiner, you guys. And in Isaiah 48, 10, it says, See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. So this is what happens, you guys. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is when you submit your will to God, when you know it's going to cost you some blood. <laughs> and then bapti baptism in fire is when you actually go through with it. And you allow God to put your flesh on a cross. And what that means is that your life is going to be ruined. Everything you wanted to keep for yourself in this life is going to be totally thrown in the garbage. Okay? You wanted to have a good reputation? Well, Jesus said that's not going to happen. If you follow him, you're going to have, you know, people are going to call your name evil. You were kind of hoping to save up some money for retirement. You're, you're kind of hoping to, you know, have a nest egg and feel secure in the money that, that you've saved up. And then in the treasures that you've stored up. Well, you know, Jesus kind of destroys that dream, too, when he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth, but store them up only in heaven. You know, the word of God comes and he destroys your flesh. Every hope that you had for this life, he destroys it. And when he brings you to that point and you submit your will to God and you say, okay, go ahead and do what you're going to do. Go ahead and cut me. Go ahead and circumcise me, Yeshua. I'm ready. I really don't want this old lover anymore. It is not my lover. It is not me. I want you. And we let him take that knife to us. He's going to start to cut away our flesh. And he is going to start working out righteousness in our life. Now, this is what it says, you guys. Now, this is a transformation that happens inside of us that is a mystery. It says that we are born of the Spirit. When, it, when something is born, knitted together in a womb, it is a mystery, okay? So don't think that you're going to be able to control it. You're not, okay? It's just like getting pregnant. You know what you've got to do to get pregnant, but you don't know what you've got to do to make a baby. You're not making this baby. God is. Okay, and it says he works all takes all things and works them together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose in Christ Jesus. All things, all kinds of trials, the trials that are your fault and the trials that are somebody else's fault. He takes them all and he takes them and he, and he works them together for your good. He turns all of your trials into something that's going to refine your faith. All right, because you're no longer held accountable for your own sin in heaven. As far as heaven's books go, Jesus Christ paid for that sin. So nothing that happens to you at this point is punishment, but it's discipline, all right? 
and the discipline, the purpose of the discipline, according to the word, is that it's going to work out God's holiness in you. And this is how, this is what it does tell us about this process, this mysterious process, and this is all we need to know. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Okay, so this is the process. This is how this happens, okay? We rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Okay? What is perseverance? It's when you stick with it when it gets hard. That's all. You just stay. You don't run away. Remember your job? Repent and believe. Okay? That's all you got to do. Believe. If you have a vision for the future, you're going to stay right there. It means that you're going to stick with God even when it gets hard. It means that you're not going to jump off of the wheel when the potter puts his hands on you to form you and it gets to be kind of the kind of pressure that hurts, you know? You're not going to turn around and look at him and say, ouch, that hurts, and jump off the wheel and run away. When he comes to rescue you on his white horse, you're not going to jump off the horse when it gets hard. When he comes to refine you in the fire, when it gets hot and sweaty, When he comes to to cut you with his word and it gets bloody, you're not going to run away from him. You're not going to run off into the darkness. You're going to stay in the light. You're going to continue to confess your sins. You're going to continue to keep your mind on God. You're going to continue to trust that he's going to finish this work. That's perseverance, sticking with it when it gets hard. And perseverance produces character. Now, what character is it going to produce in us? Well, the character of God, you guys. That's the promise that we were given, that God is going to produce his character, his fruit in us, okay? And that is an evidence that he does give us that his Holy Spirit is in us. It's, it says that we can know people by their fruit. We can know what spirit we are of by our fruit, okay? And what is the fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. All of these beautiful attributes of God. You know, whereas we were trying to be like God and we couldn't before because we were working from the outside in, now through this mysterious, wonderful process of baptism in the Holy Spirit and in fire, God is going to produce a baby in us named Jesus Christ. And he's going to grow up in us. As God says, he plants his seed in us and he's going to grow in us just like he grew in Mary's belly. He's going to grow in us and be born in us so that his character is going to start to come out. And remember how we talked in the first part, how everything that we touched because we were sinful, uh, you know, we spread death everywhere we go because of our sinful nature and character. Well, in the same way, you guys, when this spring of life starts coming out of us, it's going to spread life everywhere we go. And in our mistakes and our sins and all that kind of stuff, you guys, it's covered by God's grace. But now do you understand why grace, that the purpose of grace is not so you can stay in the darkness with your old lover? The purpose of grace is so that God can put his hands on you and start to to work out his character in you. And you're going to start to see the fruit of God's spirit. That is the proof that God gives us that he is baptizing us in the Holy Spirit. And the reason I say it that way, you guys, is because water baptism doesn't end when you come up out of the water. That is just that is just a beginning, you guys, because it, it represents a promise, and a promise is something that goes into the future. It, it, it represents us promising we're going to live out this promise that we're going to have a good conscience towards God. And baptism in the Holy Spirit is the same way. Yeah, we may have this big bang that happens at the beginning, you know, when we have our first encounter with the Holy Spirit. Maybe we're not promised that, but, you know, it happens a lot. But that's not where it ends. And you guys, please don't have a false sense of security because you speak in tongues. Because what you have to understand, you guys, is that Satan can imitate those gifts. Okay? I mean, I, may, I know this may be a shocker to you Americans, but Satan does speak other languages besides English. And just because somebody is speaking in a tongue that you don't understand doesn't mean that the spirit that's coming out of them is God. Satan knows other languages too. Okay? And you know what? We get into the flesh, and I've seen people, you guys, I've had people take me down to altars and tell me to repeat after them to get my tongue going. That is not how God gave me the gift of speaking in tongues at all. (laughs) That is of the flesh, you guys. That's us trying to impress God with our faith. And he said, all you have to do is ask. That's it. And then you just trust me. Okay? We don't have to get into the flesh on those things. We trust God, and we trust the evidence that God has given us. Okay? And the definitions that God has given us. Now, this is the way that God cleanses us from sin, you guys. This is the good news. And the good news is, you guys, that it actually works. <laughs> he cuts our heart away, our affections away from our old lover. And you know what that last bit of flesh is that goes? That's when we die. 
when we die and we have allowed all this time for God to cut us away from our sin and we have been a living sacrifice, we've laid ourselves on the altar, the Bible says that there are three witnesses, okay? There are three things. What, you know, what is God going to look at to decide? Because he has to judge us. He's going to judge. Did she really love me? Was she a prostitute or was she just a prisoner? <laughs> Was she an adulteress or was she my bride? And this is how he's going to judge. In 1 John 5, 7 through 9, it says, For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is a testimony of God, which he has given about the Son. And this is talking about um, Jesus, but it applies to us, too, because these are the three things that testify. And we follow Christ in the example that he gave us in the baptisms he went through. And that's what it's talking about. The water and the spirit and the blood. OK, the blood is the suffering. It's the fire. OK, and these three, te three things testify because God has to have our testimony that we really do love him. You know, man's testimony. That's water baptism we say, yeah, God, I love you. I want to be with you. But it's not really enough because men can lie and prostitutes lie. So he's got to have some other witnesses to make sure that it's really real. So the spirit is going to stand up and say, yeah, you know, when it came down to a hard time, when it came down to that garden of Gethsemane, this person really submitted their will to me and let me come into them and live my life out through their body. They became a living sacrifice. So the spirit's going to stand up and it says there's a three are in agreement. Okay. And then the other thing that testifies is your blood. Were you willing to, to, to resist sin to the point of shedding your blood, of letting God slay you, kill you on a cross, kill your flesh? And if God looks and sees that your blood remained intact in your body because, you know, you, you weren't willing to lay down your life like a seed, that you wanted to keep your life, if your blood remains intact, then it's really just laid on the altar of your old lover, yourself, your sinful nature, self-preservation. And your blood will testify against you. But if you were willing to lay it down and he sees that suffering that you went through, that testimony, that blood, the blood and the sweat and the tears that you went through in that furnace, that's a testimony. And it's on his altar. And he sees, yeah, not only did they say that they loved me, not only does, does the spirit say that they, that they submitted their will to him, but they submitted their will to him to the point of even shedding their own blood. In other words, they didn't even shrink from death. There was no point in time, did the, at no point in time did this person say no to God. At no point in time did they stop coming back into the light whenever they screwed up. At no point in time did they jump off of the horse. This is what God is going to look for, you guys. And this is the message of the great rescue. Now, I know that there's one question that's on some of your minds, and I want to put this to rest. You're wondering, okay, does that mean that if somebody prays a prayer of salvation at the end of their life that it's not going to work because they didn't have time to go through this process? No, you guys. We don't know how long this process takes. For every person, it's different, okay? We think in terms of time. God does not. God judges the heart, okay? So the only, uh, the only way that you even need to concern yourself with this question is if you are on your deathbed, okay? And this is what you need to know about that. You need to know that the amount of time that it's going to take for you to go through this process of water baptism and fire baptism is every single moment from this day on through the end of your life. Okay? And this is how I know that. In Hebrews 4, 7, it says that God named the day of salvation. See, and you're going to have to bow to God's decisions. And when he names the day, you don't get to rename it. It says, therefore, God again said a certain day, calling it today. When a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today... If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay? So, you guys, he knew what we would try to do. He knew that our sinful nature would try to take advantage of us and say, Oh, well, we'll do that salvation thing, but can we put it off until we've had our fun? I mean, maybe when I'm a little older or maybe when I'm on my deathbed, maybe then we'll take care of this legal business transaction with God. That is a prostitute's mindset, my friend, and God sees that. Now, here's what you need to know about that. God addresses this in Hebrews chapter 3. He says, so as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called 
today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Okay, and then it talks about at the end, it says, so we see that they were not able to enter the ones who hardened their hearts to God in the desert, the Israelites. They were not able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. So here, here it is, you guys. If you hear God's voice today and you harden your heart, this is the danger that you run. You may not have another chance to repent. First of all, you don't know if you have another day of life. Okay, that goes without saying you could be hit by a car tomorrow. All right. You don't know if you even have another day. But besides that, you guys, this is what it does to your heart. When you harden your heart to God and you say you try to rename the day of salvation, your day of salvation and say, I think I'll call that tomorrow and not today. You're hardening your heart to God. And you have to understand you cannot come to God unless he first calls you. And that drawing that you feel to repent, that need to repent, that you're ignoring, that you're hardening your heart to, that's God's voice. And every time you harden your heart to his voice, you run the risk of of allowing your heart to get so calloused that the next time that he speaks, you may not be able to hear him. And you know what happens then? You deceive yourself for the rest of your life and thinking that that day is going to come and it never comes because you can't hear him anymore and you don't even know it. One of the saddest places in the Bible is when the Bible says that Samson, he had the Spirit of the Lord, and it said the Spirit of the Lord left Samson, and he didn't even know it. And that can happen to you, my friend. So know this, whether you are at the beginning of your life or whether you are on your deathbed right now, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't say it's too late for me. Don't say it's too early for me. Don't say that they should have been yesterday or that they should be tomorrow. But bow your knee to the Lord of all, who has named the day of your salvation. He has named it today. So, since according to God's word, today is your day. Your day for salvation. Your day to be rescued from that old lover, from that old sinful nature. And to turn your your face towards a new life with God. To a new love, Jesus Christ. And I want to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer with me, you guys. And also, for those of you who have had a relationship with God, but you find yourself hiding over here in the darkness, you've lied to yourself, you've deceived yourself and said, oh yeah, I live in the darkness, I live over here, and I, give my, I offer the parts of my body to sin, but that's okay with God, me and Jesus are buddies. Now that you see that the Bible says that if you say that, you're a liar and you want to come into the light, or if you have been a hypocrite, if you've been one of those people who go to church every Sunday and you don't drink and you don't smoke and you're a deacon or maybe you're a pastor and everybody respects you spiritually and, you know, it's been a really long time since you've had to really get down on your knees and say, you know what, I have been so wrong. It's been a really long time before you've had to go before anybody else and, and apologize because of your sin. It's been a really long time since you've allowed God to humble you. If you're in that place and you recognize that you've been deceiving yourself and telling yourself, "Eh, I don't really have any really bad sin, I'm okay. And now that you recognize that the word of God says that if you say that, that you're a liar and you're calling God a liar. And you want to come into the light and you want to take off your hypocrite's mask. You want to take off your religious Sunday mask and you want to get real with God and you want to get real with everybody else and say, you know what, I am a sinner, I am dirty, I cannot pretend anymore, but I want to walk in the light with Jesus. If that is where you are today, you guys, then I would encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for showing your unconditional love to me. Through the blood that you shed on the cross in order to pay for my sins and in order to buy me out of slavery, Lord God, I know that I have this sinful nature and I know that I can't overcome it. But I am turning away from it right now, and I'm giving you permission to bring me out into the desert where I'm going to be uncomfortable, and I'm going to have to trust you. I'm going to let you do that, and I'm going to make you a promise right now. This is my promise to you, God, that I will keep a good conscience towards you, that I will keep a good mind towards you, that I will not resent you even when things get hard, that I will not believe that you've left me or forsaken me to die in the desert, that I won't accuse you of those things, that I will trust you. That even when I don't feel you, you are there. And that you are indeed singing me songs. And that you are winning my heart. And I will call you my husband instead of calling you my master. And I tell you, God, that even when you bring me to the place where you're going to require a sacrifice of me, 
that my flesh does not want to give, when you require my very heart, I am going to say to you, and I say to you even now, not my will, God, not my will, but yours be done in my life. And I will allow you, even though you slay me, even though you cut me to the very heart, even though I lay my life on the altar and I pour, I'm poured out as a drink offering, even though you slay me, I will still trust in you. And I will believe that you are going to finish this great rescue that you started. And one more time, I just want to thank you. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for rescuing me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just said this prayer with me, you guys, you can be confident of this, that Jesus Christ is going to be faithful to continue and rescue you until the very end, until he gets you past that finish line, until he gets you over that Jordan River into the promised land, you guys. You have a lot to look forward to. You have a lot to hope for. And this is what I would encourage you to do. First of all, I would ask you to go and um, email me at the email address that um, that's below. We want to know that you've made this decision so that we can pray for you. And I would also encourage you to go to www.thefinalword.tv and click on the subscribe button um, and sign up for our email list so that you can get um, the weekly Bible teachings in your email inbox, okay? Because what you need to put into your head is the Word of God. And not just my teaching, but mainly just read the Bible, you guys. Spend some time with God every day and um, watch Him teach you. He is going to teach you. He is going to be faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to purify you guys from all unrighteousness. And most of all, he's going to bring you to this place of how, being in this wonderful love relationship with him. And he will keep you to the very end, you guys. That's where our eternal security comes in. We do not have our hope or our faith in some doctrine of man. We don't have to do that. We have our hope and our faith in the fact that the one who rescues us, he's really good at it. So place your trust in him, you guys. And I will see you again next week. It's